Hello, I'm Johnny Langridge and welcome to this, our third episode of Music for the Eyes, a new series by Garsington Opera at Home, where we explore opera alongside other arts. And I'm delighted to be joined again by Dr Imogen Tedbury. Hi, Imi. Hi, Johnny. How are you? Really good, thank you. Now, this week, we're pleased to be bringing you something from the 20th century. It's Britain's The Turn of the Screw, of course, based on Henry James's novella of the same name. We have two fantastic guests this week in Louisa Muller, who directed the piece at Garsington Opera last summer in 2019, and Ruth Livesey, Professor of 19th Century Literature and Thought at Royal Holloway. So uh, why don't you grab a drink or whatever else you need to enjoy the next 30 minutes of discussion. And Imi, why don't you tell us what we're going to be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start by talking to Louisa about her recent production. And we'll then talk to Ruth a little bit about uh, Henry James and the novella and the context for that. And we'll also take in the history of childhood, Freud, and we'll of course end with some discussion of the ghosts. So we're going to start by looking at the moment that the governess arrives at her new home to look after two children. This is Sophie Bevan singing the role of the governess in Britain's The Turn of the Screw at Garsington Opera. So there, we are perfectly situated to start our discussion here. Um, hi, Louisa. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, greetings from Vienna. It's great to have you with us. Now, I remember back to when you were putting this production together at Garsington, and when I asked you how you were going to approach the production, you very mod modestly said, well, I'm just going to tell the story. Um, you told the story fantastically, but tell me, wh why was that your approach? It really feels like a perfect thing already, the, the piece, the opera. Um, feels like the, the, the pacing is already there and the narrative is already there and the storytelling is already there. And so in a large way, the biggest thing you have to do is sort of get out of its way and make sure that you're not adding a bunch of other things because so much of it relies, I think, on the audience having their, bringing their own baggage into the theater, really, <laughs> that helps them know how to interpret it. Yeah, and the, the theatre, of course, um, is perhaps not like every other theatre that we've ever been to. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Garsington, it, it has natural light flooding in from the side. And how did you approach that, given that, you know, it's a spooky story? Yeah, I think, you know, it felt like really the only choice was to embrace that aspect of the theatre. And as we, um, my designers and I, Christopher Oram and Malcolm Ripeth, as we prepared it, we decided to really just completely use that as a benefit. So we made a set out of glass 
Um, it's really quite open to the elements and it felt actually in the end, I think completely perfect for this story, which has to sort of creep up on you. In the, in the, in the beginning, the, the space has to feel so beautiful that the governess is just really bowled over by it when she arrives. And it's really very incremental that she starts to feel some other elements. And it felt like that in the theater, that as night fell, and certainly after you come back from the interval, that as it was getting darker and darker, it was feeling more and more claustrophobic and sinister. And all of that was sort of helped by the natural light. Picking up on that idea of claustrophobia, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about your decision to set it in the 19th century, not even when Henry James was, was writing uh, in the late 1890s, but even earlier than that. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it was about um, sort of, well, honestly, most of it was about the dresses. <laughs> Said it, we said it, uh, you know, the, the fashion in, in the 19th century is changing really sort of almost every decade, the, sh the shapes that the women are wearing. And um, so when Christopher and Or Orem and I were deciding exactly when we wanted to place it, we, he showed me pictures of, he said, okay, so if we're sort of 1860s, then we're in a dress that's with a quite tight bodice and a huge skirt. And then if we're just one decade later, then the skirt has really changed and it's narrowed out and it has a bustle in the back. And we both said, oh no, no, it has to be these big, these big skirts. Um, and so actually the, 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 the dresses themselves provide so much of the claustrophobia so that we're in a wide open space. The, the set, uh, the, the stage of Garsington is really very wide. Um, and we didn't, we didn't close it down very much at all. Um, we're in a wide open space, but the, the dresses themselves are sort of for each of the women, their own, <laughs> their own claustrophobia that they carry with them. Um, it's actually the perfect dresses for uh, social distancing, I think. <laughs> it completely is. I mean, just having heard that clip as well, you know, the, the, the musical language it also suggests huge space. You know, it's very light and airy, that scene. How, yeah. how, how is it structured to get the tension in? Well, it's interesting, the whole, the whole piece is set with these interludes between each scene and the interludes, they start with a theme at the beginning and then each interlude is a variation. And the way it's structured is all, um, I think it sounds, when you talk about it, it sounds quite academic, um, but the effect of it is very different than that. I think the effect of it is that you don't even know that you're sort of hearing that same theme over and over again each time a uh, semitone um, different and going up and then going back down again. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't necessarily perceive that in the audience, but you do feel that there's this sort of repetition and the claustrophobia again that we spoke about. I mean, I have some perfect paintings for that, Louisa. Um, I'm just going to show you now. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the, the work of the Danish painter Wilhelm Hammershoi, um, who, is, who is painting around the time of Henry James, uh, creating these beautiful, claustrophobic, repetitive interiors. Um, this painting here is his interior in Strandgarda, um, Sunlight on the Floor, from 1901, so just three years after James's novella was published in 1898. Here we're looking at his wife, Ida, sitting in her black dress, seated, reading perhaps, um, in an interior of uh, the couple's house. They moved into this house in 1898 and there are over 60 paintings from Hammershoy's work that show this interior of this house in particular. Um, he often paints Ida from behind in this way, wearing this black dress, showing her long neck to us, bent over doing something we can't quite see. Here he's really squashed her into the left-hand third of the painting. Um, she's seated at this table. You can see a very beautiful shine of the light on the table, on the chair leg, and a gleam of light on the back of her neck as well, this kind of radiance that she has coming from the window. Above her, you'll see a couple of portraits, but we can't see quite who the subjects are. They're blurred out, as are many of the details in this painting and in Hammershoy's work. 
um, the centre of the painting is of course taken up with this glorious window streaming sunshine coming in through these very um, beautifully delineated panes of glass casting this light on the floor. A light that seems I, th I think really speaks to you Louisa what you were saying about how sinister daylight can be. This light that is penetrating this room in this way. I don't find this perhaps just you know we're talking about turn of the screw here but for me I don't I find this very unsettling um, this uh, particular detail of the light the way that it's uh, evade that kind of coming into our personal space if you like and then on the right of the painting this very imposing large door frame with a door that is just slightly ajar you can see that shadow running along the top of the doorway the door is maybe slightly opening, there might be someone on the other side of it. I also would like to draw your attention to the slight uh, tilt of the lower right hand part of the door frame here. You can see this line is not exactly straight and that for me really I guess highlights the painter's craft. It gives us a lurch and emphasizes the fact that this is a painted scene while also making the scene itself seem slightly less real. Um, Hamishoy was really interested in painting light, in painting dust, in painting these sort of natural effects, giving substance to the insubstantial. And here I'm showing you um, a painting of exactly the same interior, you'll recognize it here, a painting of dust dancing in sunbeams. So here again, the light is intruding, penetrating into the interior space in a way that is for me certainly quite sinister. Um, these paintings are of course, really a reference to the work of artists like Vermeer. Hamishoy was very interested in the work of Vermeer, but unlike something like Vermeer's woman reading with a letter uh, from the Reuters Museum, Hamishoy turns us around so we're looking at it from a different angle. We can't see the woman's face, Ida's face, his wife's face. Instead we're looking at her from behind and the window, which is often out of sight in Vermeer's paintings, becomes the central point, the window in which we're potentially looking out, potentially someone else is looking in, this real mystery in the ambiguity of the space. And this last painting I'll just finish with, another of Hamishoy's interiors from his house at Strandegarda, again Ida in her black dress, again she's seated, again she's reading, but we get a longer view. This time the door is open and another door is open and we can see right down this corridor, but unlike those Dutch genre paintings that we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks, through these doorways there is nothing, it's empty. We wonder if the sitter, if the woman, if Ida can see something we can't see. Does she know that we're looking at her? What is she looking at? What is she doing? There are so many sort of veiled and plaited, ambiguous questions going on in these paintings that for me really speak to some of the dramas of looking and being looked at in Britain's opera and of course in James's novella. Um, and that cues me up very nicely to speak uh, to Ruth, um, who I'd like to bring in now. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the background to James writing this story. How, how did he come to write this great, well, ghost story um, in the late 1890s? Well, really, we can think of this story alongside a whole wave of a return of interest in in playing around with the forms of, the, of Gothic storytelling. Um, so really, we could think of the Gothic as, as having two great waves, one in the late 18th, early 19th century, where you have um, you know, Horace Walpole's exper uh, experiments, the monk, Castle of Otranto, the Italian, these, these Gothic stories set in exotic places and castles full of, of strange happenings with cowled monks um, and dead bodies out of nowhere. Um, and, and really across the 19th century, that there's a, it becomes a less fashionable genre of writing. But by the 1880s and 1890s, um, there's a resurgence of interest. And we could think, you know, these are the decades in which we have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dracula, Wilde's Picture of Dorian Gray, um, and all these um, writers, great writers, come together to, to, to really move away from a, from a straightforward realism 
um, to, to, ex to explore the mysterious, the ghostly, um, perhaps the subconscious. So two directions for that really. One, one is that this relates to what you're saying about Hamashoi very much. An interest in, in what we can't know about each other, the unknowable, what's going on beneath the surface is, is very strongly present in these texts. Um, and, uh, and certainly never more so than in, in James's novel, this sense that the, the surface that we see and the depth we can only speculate about might be traveling in slightly different directions. And for, for James, in, in addition to him responding perhaps to a, to a wave of new writing in this, in this experimental way, um, we can also think of the context in which his brother, William James, as a noted um, psychologist, um, and like many, many thinkers in this era, took um, the ghostly and the, the psychic phenomenon deeply seriously. Um, and Henry James himself read a, read a paper by his brother on uh, spirit phenomena to the Society of Psychical Research in London just a few years before he wrote um, the novella, The Turn of the Screw. So there's that very, very real interest and, and context in, in the ghostly and the gothic. And what James does in a really knowing way is is also play with our expectations because unlike Wilde or um, Stevenson in Jekyll and Hyde or indeed in Dracula, uh, where we, you know, we, the, the Gothic story is transplanted to a, a very recognizable modern day London, um, James actually looks back and, and I love the way that Louise's production has really spoken to that kind of backwardness of the story and, and placed it in precisely the costume era of, of, an, of a story we know that James is playing with here, which of course is Jane Eyre. Um, the story of a governor sent to a mysterious mansion. She's in love with her boss. Um, there are these sounds in the night. What are they? Um, so there's a very knowing play with that, that story of Jane Eyre that, 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 that using the kind of crin the language of the crinoline in a way really speaks to brilliantly in this, in this production. Because in the story, uh, it, it has a frame like many Gothic novels do. Um, we have, as the production makes clear, our, our narrator Douglas at the beginning tells us this story, the manuscript he was sent by the governess, um, who in the story we hear goes on to have a, a future career, which is a little disturbing in its own right. Um, and, uh, uh, but, and it's very common in Gothic stories to have this kind of frame narrative that someone tells us in, a, in a, a less strange world, tells us of this strange story they've heard and repeats it to us. And often in, in, in novels, um, such as in Frankenstein, perhaps most famously, the frame then closes at the other end of it. You know, we, we retreat back out of the, the, the world of the fantastic into the person who start, first started telling us this story. Now, um, a bit like Hammershoy's doorway left ajar, and we're not quite sure what she's looking at, uh, there is no closing frame to the turn of the screw. Um, and that seems really important with leaving us with that deep ambiguity, uh, certainly that the novella gives us at the ending as to, to who's done what, but perhaps we'll come back to that later. But for James as well, he is such an important novelist for thinking about the aesthetic movement in the late 19th century. And this idea that beauty was truth, was the, the meaning of life. You didn't never, never look beyond the surface, just look at the surface and you'll find enough truth there. That's a terrible paraphrase of Oscar Wilde, by the way. Um, and, uh, and there are all these moments in the text where uh, by the side of the lake, for example, the governess is just saying to Mrs. Gross, look, look, can't you see it? It's just blazing there. And the governess can see nothing. We don't know if the children do or not. Um, equally, when Miles's crime, whatever is, is revealed, Mrs. Gross says to the governess, just look at him. He can't be guilty. He's so beautiful. Surely innocence is visible. It, there, there isn't a surface and depth with these children. So that's the big theme, I think, of surface depth, body, soul, that, that um, of, of conscious mind and subconscious action that, that James always glories in his writing, leaving it so uncertain, and so unreliable. I'd love to pick up just there on, on the subject of innocence. And, and Louisa, you know, we have discussed in the past that one of the, one of the differences in Mafanwe Piper's libretto is, is the fact that she puts in this, this almost mantra of the ceremony of innocence is drowned. What, what does that mean to you as a director and how, how do you treat that? Well, the context of that scene is really interesting because it's a scene that doesn't exist in any shape in the novella. Um, it's um, the two ghosts by themselves talking to each other about sort of their plot for what they will do with the children, that they are each looking for a companion in the afterlife and they're going to somehow bring these children to their, to their side. I think the 
the theme of innocence and loss of innocence, um, those are throughout the piece and, and part of it is with the children that, sh that the governess is always worrying about protecting their innocence and how innocent are they, but then of course it's also about her own innocence and what she can sort of keep hold of um, through the entire unraveling really um, <laughs> that she goes through. Mm. I mean, just picking up on that, on the innocence of children and, and whether, whether the innocence of children can be known or not. I mean, this really speaks to sort of Victorian ideas of childhood and the psychology of, of childhood, um, which really develop in the 19th century. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, there is uh, there are really kind of two ideas about childhood. There's you know the innocent child very close to God, and then there's the sinning child who needs to be controlled and punished. This sort of evangelizing idea of of, of the sinner. Um, and I guess Rousseau is sort of speaking to that as well. The kind of um, freedom of childhood. Sort of these ideas come in, but in the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, starts to be a new interest in the kinds of unruly passions of childhood. Um, if you think about something like the mill on the floss or even Alice in Wonderland actually, the idea that children are having emotions and passions that we can't know and we can't control um, sort of starts to be something of interest and perhaps of, of fear. Um, I'm showing you here um, a painting by Whistler. Um, his absolutely glorious harmony in grey and green a portrait of miss cicely alexander he painted it in 1873 initially he was commissioned to paint a painting of her older sister but when he saw cicely he decided that he wanted to paint her instead in the pose of manet's uh, lola de valence which slightly suggestive and problematic to me certainly um but here she is um, posing in this dress, in this costume, in this setting that Whistler has very carefully chosen himself, these greys and greens that he is so particular about getting those contrasting harmonies. We know that he required poor Sicily, who was only eight at the time, to sit or rather stand for him on over 70 occasions. Um, the poor girl, and she wrote in later life that she really felt that she'd been the victim of Whistler's artistic ambition and that uh, she'd always been very cross and angry by the end of the day. Um, and I think you can see this sort of sulky expression of hers in this painting um, was something that was really picked up by critics at the time when the painting was first exhibited at the Pall Mall Galleries in 1873, people commented that this was a disagreeable painting of a disagreeable girl. Um, this idea that she couldn't be controlled, that her emotional state is really at the fore of this painting in a way that Whistler perhaps couldn't control, um, is extremely interesting. And I, I think really speaks to some of these ideas about um, those passions and uh, mental states of childhood that maybe we can't understand and adults can't understand, perhaps as the governess can't understand her charges in this way. It strikes me as well that there's an element of the artist and perhaps even the viewer projecting their own feelings of these images of, of children, which of course often gets us into murky territory. But, but um, before we have a chat about that, maybe a little later, Louisa, I, I wondered, in the opera, do you feel really that it's the children who are the ones being weird? I think it's important that um, you never quite know, even really all the way through that they, we, we played a lot with sort of different elements of children's games. Um, and I think children's games are quite weird. I think um, the imagination of children is something that is sort of alien. I, I have a two-year-old at home and already sort of her rich inner imaginative, imaginative life that we get little glimpses of is already so sort of disparately things she's grabbed from all different areas of her life. And I think, so we, we played around a lot with games that could be interpreted in two ways, could either be just play, children playing, or could have a more sort of sinister element to it. And certainly the governess then responds to the sinister, the potential sinister, sinister element in them. Mm. I think if we could just pick up on that and on this idea of the sinister, there is, there is this, this sort of thread running through 
um, the opera and the novella. Um, and Britain is, is writing after some of the earlier interpretations of the novella. Ruth, could you tell us a bit more about some of these interpretations of the novella? Sure, yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, the story has been subject to some of the most uh, famous experiments in early Freudian criticism. So as early as the 1940s, um, the critic Evan Wilson went to town on the novel and in a way that seems a bit kind of crude now, said, well, clearly this is a, a, a young Victorian woman. She must be sexually repressed. She can't speak the word desire or, or anything like that. And therefore, when we see, it, you know, Peter Quint appears up a tower, clearly this is a phallic symbol. She then sees Miss Jessel on the other side of a lake. That's clearly the opposite of phallic symbol. This is a kind of uterine kind of image here of the, of the water and the rest of it. Um, and, you know, this is the manifestation of her repressed sexuality. You know, tick, tick, all done. <laughs> this is the, the Freudian in interpretation. I, I, obviously, I travesty this a little bit. Um, but, it, but it really became a cause celebre in, in whether we really want to go with a Freudian kind of interpretation. Now, the novel is, of course, really interested in ideas of the subconscious. I mean, you know, William James, Henry's brother, uh, it, it come, first comes up with the phrase stream of consciousness. And it's really the, one of the first thinkers to really talk about this idea of there being a double, a kind of a double mind. So Henry James himself is equally fascinated with these ideas. But I would say when I teach this novel, you know, it's not actually um, repressing the fact, she's very explicit about the fact that she has a huge crush on her boss, frankly, you know, right from the beginning. Um, and, and I always think it's a mistake um, to, to, project backwards and, and, and see anyone in a crinoline as, as sexually repressed basically I mean, you only need to read Jane Eyre and to, to hear about her sitting on Rochester's lap and doing goodness knows what to realize there's a, a real degree of sexual latitude and, and desire is, is there in the Victorian period um, so you know obviously at the time there were there were counterweights to this to this Freudian criticism that came across um, you know th that fed the debate I mean more recently I suppose we might want to think carefully about um, James's own sexuality um, and the way in which there are moments in this text where the ambiguity about what Miles has done at school, I mean, in, in, the, in the novella, it's, it's that really strong sense that he might poison the other boys, he might be a bad influence on the other boys. There's always, although James always leaves this so open and ambiguous, the sense that this might be a sexual misdemeanor in a boys boarding school is, is there, you know, it's loose in the text, I think. And, and again, the way in which Mrs. Gross describes Peter Quint's relationship with Miles too has this sense that that was this a uh, you know now it's very hard to read those moments in the novella and not think about a story of abuse partly because that's what's around us now in the way that perhaps Freudian interpretations were so very much in the air in the in the 1940s. Um, but James is is never prescriptive about this. It, I think reading James in a kind of paranoid way to think you're going to find some one secret and key is is kind of counter to what he he wants to do as an artist what james certainly wants to do as an artist is this um lovely image by the critic tony tanner which i can never help shoving in any lecture or talk um which is that james uses a kind of art form uh, uh, art as a as a kind of image of like a velvet rope roping off a vip area and in james's work it's as if he takes readers always to that velvet rope we're just standing there and we can just get a sense of something really glamorous or perhaps a bit dark and spooky happening on the other side of that rope. We can catch the odd phrase, see the odd movement of a body, but we can never be in that space because we're not of that space, but we can get a kind of sense. Of, but the pleasure of art for James is pressing against the rope, the kind of never quite knowing, just sensing, but never quite knowing is, is there. And Interestingly, if you go to the micro level of the text uh, and see the revisions James made between the, the magazine part issue of the novella and its bookish form, um, that sense that the difference between the language of feeling something, seeing something and knowing something um, is, is, is one of the revisions he made. So, so is, this, is the governess actually seeing things, look, 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 or is she feeling things? And he, he very carefully calibrated that language throughout the story. At the very top of the opera, of course, uh, and in the novella, um, we've got the prologue. And just before we have a look at that, Louisa, I just I want to ask you about this, the subject of the, how reliable our narrator is here. Can we trust everything we're told? That's interesting. I mean, exactly as Ruth said, that there's no sort of following on bookend to this prologue that 
when I was wrestling with the piece, that was something that really bothered me, actually. Sort of like, who is he and why do we care about him and we never see him again? And we chose to cast him as he was in the original production of this opera as the same singer singing Peter Quint and singing the prologue. Um, and I really, something that's so prevalent, as Ruth said, in the, in the novella is her sort of fascination with this employer. Um, she keeps thinking about him and she thinks, the first time she sees Quint, she thinks it is the employer. And that felt so important to me and an element that isn't really in the opera, not nearly as much because you're not hearing so much of her inner, inner monologue. So anyway, we made in the prologue then that she really, we watch her have this interaction with the employer and the narrator becomes the employer and then later becomes Quentin. Yeah. Well, let's take a, a look at that now. It's um, Ed Lyon as the prologue and Sophie Bevan as the governess. for everything, not to worry him at all, no, not to write, but to be silent, and do her best. She was Carried away that he, so gallant and handsome, so deep in the busy world, should need a help. At last, I will, she said. Perhaps the final question that I have, Louisa, is in your mind, is this a ghost story and are these ghosts real? I think it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I think we have to be with the governess every step of the way and for her they're so real that we have to see them as real too and then I think later when we're driving home from the opera then we have to think, wait, but why do I think that? And where did I come to that? I love that idea that, you know, it sort of tugs at our own mental tapestry and you go questioning down the road. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end. Hopefully we've unanswered as many questions as you had to start with. Uh, and it just remains for me to thank very much our guests this week, Louisa and Ruth. And uh, next week, what do we have coming up, Imi? Next week, it's Eugene Onyegin. Well, really looking forward to that. And I think to finish, uh, today we will look at perhaps one of the most haunting elements of this piece. Uh, it is the character uh, of Miles singing a song that he has found. This is Marlowe. <laughs>